Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Vive Healthcare. This program is presented by Medscape Education Global. Hello, I'm Giovanni Guaraldi. I'm Associate Professor of Infectious Diseases and I'm the Chair of the Modern HIV Metabolic Clinic at the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia in Italy. Welcome in this program titled HIV and Inflammation, Raising Awareness of the Impact of Inflammation on People Living with HIV. Joining me today is Professor Miley Karis, who is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Division of Infectious Diseases and Global Public Health and Geriatrics and Gerontology at UC San Diego. Welcome. Giovanni, it's such a pleasure to be here with you today. Very good. Actually, we have a very interesting learning objective for you today. Actually, we will try to increase knowledge regarding the impact of chronic immune dysfunction and inflammation in HIV patients. And we will try to go into the relationship between chronic inflammation in people living with HIV and comorbidities, but also aging. And in the last part, we will try to address which are the intervention to manage comorbidities associated with inflammation. And so with no further ado, I believe that uh, we need to get into the topic and uh, I will ask my colleague, Miley, what is driving inflammation and uh, which are the cells, the tissue and even the organs that are implicated in this? Well, um, inflammation in people living with HIV is, is multifactorial and intersecting. Multiple initiators of inflammation include HIV itself, um, other chronic co-infections, including cytomegalovirus and hepatitis C and hepatitis B. We also know that HIV-associated non-AIDS conditions, such as substance use and obesity, also contribute to activation of the innate immune system. And liver fibrosis from HIV, medication toxicity, hepatitis, and or alcohol additionally contribute via microbial translocation or leaky gut, as we say. Very good. And uh, how does HIV cause inflammation? Uh, HIV is, is very interesting in how it causes inflammation. You know, activated CD4 T cells, which are the specific HIV target, are easiest to infect compared to other types of resting CD4 T cells, for example. And they exist in abundance in gut-associated lymphoid tissue, also known as GALT, because that organ has to basically keep our gut microorganisms from invading the body. So there's a lot of these activated CD4 T cells there. When they're infected uh, with HIV, they are massively depleted, specifically in that area, and which also causes some destruction of the architecture of the GALT. So that permanently alters the, the function of that very large immune organ in our body. And this, you know, ultimately uh, then allows that bacterial translocation that we kind of briefly mentioned earlier, uh, as well as reactivation of other viruses like cytomegalovirus. And although HIV causes the depletion of one of the arms of the immune system, it also initiates activation of other arms, specifically CD8 T cell responses and pro-inflammatory macrophages and dendritic cells. So in one way, it's it immunosuppresses, but in another way, our immune system responds to it and causes chronic inflammation related to that. And if antiretroviral therapy is not initiated, this ongoing immune suppression and chronic activation just really exhausts the immune system, resulting in senescent cells. And Giovanni, um, what markers do you use to evaluate inflammation? 
Well, you see, Miley, actually, uh, you explained very well that uh, there are several biomarkers that uh, can be assessed whenever you want to address the systemic immune activation. But uh, if I am at the bedside, I realize that actually the numbers of these biomarkers turn to be very low. Actually, most of these biomarkers, for instance, imagine cytokines like uh, IL-6 or even uh, coagulation marker like D-dimer have been proven to be very effective at a population level to predict comorbidities, cardiovascular event, and even mortality. But uh, let me say, at uh, the single patient level, this is not the case. And actually, what we know, and I would like to present uh, this nice study that was, uh, was on the Icona court by Christina Mussini. Actually, it was shown that uh, presumably the most, uh, let us say, easy to measure marker associated with uh, inflammation is in fact the CD4, CD8 ratio. Actually, nowadays in a setting where most of our patients have undetectable viral load and high CD4, CD8 are even more, let us say, informative. And the CD4, CD8 ratio, as it is shown here in model two, was uh, independently predictor of mortality in this court. So actually we try also to use at the clinical bedside this, for instance, uh, in this slides uh, from uh, the JEPO court, remember JEPO is a court of uh, people, geriatric people that are more than 65 years of age. This was uh, 1,092 individuals. We try to understand what was uh, the predictors of having a CD4, CD8 ratio above one, that it should be normal. And uh, you see in this situation, actually, this was associated with uh, undetectable viral load, female sex, uh, and uh, nadir CD4 cell count. Okay, but uh, if there are, in fact, uh, some uh, HIV parameters associated with the natural history. It's my turn, Miley. How does the duration of untreated HIV may impact inflammation? And what are the possible consequences uh, in regard of what can we do at a clinical level? I, I, you know, I really like how you asked that question because I think it is important to discern between duration of HIV infection and duration of untreated HIV infection. Um, certainly, it is this ongoing HIV uremia rather than the duration of HIV infection that is leading to the ongoing inflammation that we often see in people living with HIV. Um, you know, once a person living with HIV is undetectable, immune activation and inflammation starts to decrease. But, you know, I did say in an earlier slide that um, very early on in HIV infection, you know, there's this destruction of the GALT. And so it doesn't actually the inflammation doesn't quite go back to normal. So people living with HIV, unless they get started on antiretroviral therapy really early, say like a couple months from their point of infection, um, never quite achieve the levels of these markers <laughs> of inflammation that we see in HIV seronegative persons. Um, so differences still do exist, although you know you can they certainly minimize inflammation by getting on art early and staying on art. And there's also some really interesting data to suggest that achieving 100% adherence also is impactful. So there's, uh, you know, actually there's several papers now published reporting differences in people that are, say that they are 100% adherent versus 85 to 99 versus less than 85. And this was one of the original papers, you know, it was evaluating biomarkers of, of inflammation in participants of the multi-center AIDS cohort study, which is a large cohort study here in the US. And it really demonstrated differences in inflammatory biomarkers based on, on what people reported their adherence was. And you know, this is a small squares, but if you look, you can see kind of these squares in yellow. So those were the people that were reporting less than 85% adherence. The squares or the triangles are persons that reported anywhere between 85 to 99 percent. And when you compared those biomarker levels to people who were saying they are 100 percent adherence, there are some clear differences in inflammation. Um, so, you know, certainly uh, adherence matters. And, you know, Giovanni, I'd really like to hear what your thoughts are on how chronic inflammation and immune dysfunction can impact the pathogenesis of comorbidities in people living with well, that's a, that's a long story to go. I, I think I 
we can concentrate on something. So I, I found that this uh, this very recent review very interesting. Please concentrate on the central of uh, the design of the circle. Uh, you understand that uh, you already mentioned that there are various triggers of inflammation that are reported to contribute to low-grade chronic inflammation, but I would now concentrate on the fact that fat alteration in particular can have, uh, let us say, an important role with regard of the inflammatory, inflammatory process. And so I, I want to quote uh, this, uh, this uh, important, uh, let us say, uh, uh, paper that was published on the Lancet uh, Diabetes and Endocrinology a few years ago. But actually what is shown here is that it's not all the fat is uh, this, this is what we call ectopic fat. For instance, uh, the fat present at uh, the visceral level, the hepatic fat at uh, the epicardial level, even the liver fat is associated with uh, atherogenic dyslipidemia, insulin resistance, thrombotic state, and inflammatory state. Apparently, this fat is a true endocrine organ which produces inflammatory markers and cytokines, and this is associated with the natural history of many comorbidities, but in particular is the cardiovascular disease. And so we know that uh, it's really important to study fat in order to study the inflammatory process. And so actually, uh, I, I, I tried to think what was my, let us say, um, professional life in the past 30 years. Actually, I'm old enough to remember what was a Wolstein syndrome. I was working in Africa as a junior doctor. At that time, HIV was called the slim disease because actually it was the weight of loss that was one of the early signs for diagnosis. At that time, I didn't even have an HIV testing and it was weight loss that contributed to the diagnosis of AIDS. Okay, but after, of course, we had drugs, but uh, with uh, the early heart period, actually all the lipodystrophy story came mm. out. And uh, due to toxicity of early antiretroviral therapy, most of the patient didn't really change that much their weight, but rather actually decrease uh, the fat in the periphery. But at the same time, an ongoing process was starting and is still all there. That is uh, what we call the lipohypertrophy, central fat accumulation. In this situation, we had some weight gain, not that severe as what we experience now in uh, the new clinical manifestation of weight gain and obesity epidemic. And so what, what is happening? Why somehow these uh, anthropometric changes are telling us the changing the natural history of HIV disease across these uh, 30 years of history. Well, I would like to stress the fact that uh, th there is uh, a crossroad between metabolism and inflammation. And actually, if uh, you see this figure, you understand that uh, in uh, metabolic organs, including the liver, the brain, the pancreas, and especially the adipose tissue, there are resident macrophages which interact with stromal cell in the regulation of nutrient availability. And this is uh, the, the good metabolic homeostasis. But uh, when this equilibrium gets wrong, well, actually this cell can produce mediator, we call adipokine, that may cause systemic inflammation and uh, metabolic alteration. And the result is uh, the so-called immune metabolic disorder. And so I would really try to address the fact that metabolism and inflammation really tell the same story in people living with HIV. And because of this, well, it may be something good because nowadays assessing metabolism is not just assessing blood glucose or cholesterol level in a, in a test tube, but rather I can develop this idea of immune metabolic disorder that can be measured at uh, an organ level. And of course, uh, the organ level is uh, the liver. And uh, I can address really the metabolic activity of the liver with uh, a transient elastrography. In, in this, mm -hmm. actually I can measure non-invasively, for instance, uh, the 
fat quantity or at the level of fibrosis that may be the result of the inflammatory process associated with uh, tissue adipose uh, uh, concentration. And I will end up to the definition of NAFL. NAFL is defined as uh, the excessive hepatic fat accumulation in more than 5% of adipocytes. Well, this may be a risk factor, but actually in particular in people living with HIV, this may promote fibrosis, ballooning, and uh, inflammatory cell migration. And this will end up with uh, the, all the big issue of NASH, uh, that is uh, a full-blown disease condition that have been associated with multiple comorbidities. Of course, uh, the cardiovascular disease, but also the cardiac hypertrophy, the congestive gut failure, but also arrhythmias, and in particular, arterial fibrillation, and uh, and also chronic kidney disease, but even some kind of cancer. And so I believe that this idea of moving from, uh, let us say, inflammation to immune metabolic condition is a clinical process that will help us uh, to study how the comorbidity, uh, let us say, uh, issue is uh, changing across the aging process of people living with HIV. And so Miley, I ask you, uh, what's the literature tell us about uh, the, the risk of chronic diseases because of chronic inflammation? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I like how you really laid out the changing face of HIV and certainly that is very, very true. And really thankfully for the advances that we've made in antiretroviral therapy, accomplished because of you know, the joint efforts of the community and clinicians and researchers, uh, there has been a steadily narrowing lifespan gap comparing people living with HIV uh, and HIV so negative persons. So we're certainly closing that lifespan gap. People living with HIV today are expected to live a near normal lifespan, and that's amazing. However, um, we unfortunately have not made similar progress in closing the comorbidity gap or life without any, uh, without uh, non-HIV comorbidity for years. Um, so we do know that uh, people living with HIV tend to accumulate other medical conditions earlier and in excess of HIV so ne negative persons. And, you know, some of that work, Giovanni, you've done uh, and contributed to, to uh, our knowledge of that. But if we break it down, not all comorbidities are present in excess in older adults or people living with HIV. Conditions like hepatitis C may be due to some overlap in acquisition risk with HIV. Others like anemia, osteoporosis, and kidney disease may be associated with antiretroviral therapy. But many excess comorbidities appear to bundle under what we call metabolic syndrome, things like hypertension tension, dyslipidemia, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, as, as presented here in this great graph. Um, Giovanni, how does inflammation impact our aging patients? Well, I think uh, what you're asking me is uh, what step forwards. Now it's, let us say, well established that uh, uh, inflammation and uh, immune metabolic uh, alteration may impact comorbidities, as you told me. But unluckily, the complexity is not just because patients have got single comorbidities, but because they have uh, altogether what we call multimorbidity. Nevertheless, this is not even enough because of the complexity of aging is not just because we accumulate diseases, we move from single comorbidities to multimorbidity, but because we end up to have geriatric syndrome and among all, the most important is frailty. And so you see, I would like to show this uh, vicious circle in which you understand that uh, the pathway of frailty pathogenesis are many and are all associated with a dysregulator, dysregulated inflammation in HIV. Okay, this is a very complex framework to understand uh, the development of frailty. And you see that there are back and forth mechanism related comorbidities, related fatigue, related wasting and sarcopenia, and related obesity and lipodystrophy. And so all these are actors that produce frailty and frailty produces this condition. And for this reason, I think nowadays it's important to recognize that frailty, which is conceptualized as a measure of biological age, 
is somehow associated with uh, the immune metabolic condition. And so let me show you this paper that uh, we were able to publish last year in which we try to address if there was any association between uh, liver steatosis, what we call NAFLD, and especially NAFLD with fibrosis was uh, associated with frailty. And actually here we measure frailty with a frailty index. And so in this table, you can see that in fact, NAFLD with fibrosis was very much correlated with many comorbidities, but also neurocognitive impairment, vitamin D insufficiency, type two diabetes, osteoporosis, and so on and so forth. But actually, when we try to look at what was, uh, let us say, the predictors of frailty, what we ended up was that, of course, a frailty may have been predicted by the complexity of multimorbidity, but frailty was independently predicted by by uh, fibrosis and the steatosis. And so somehow this returned me an idea that frailty is like a big umbrella in which uh, it's not, let us say, a, a comorbidities on the top of the other comorbidities, but it's a big umbrella in which uh, multimorbidity contribute, but also NAFLD contribute in the development of this condition. And so, well, we said many things, but I believe now we need to get into the clinic and so, I'm uh, in the clinic tomorrow morning, uh, and, uh, and Miley, I, I really ask you, what's the best practice for comorbidities management in uh, people aging with HIV now? Yeah, you know, you and I are both infectious disease physicians, um, but I think we've both realized that it's, it's really best to care for people living with HIV if we move past HIV primacy. So, you know, we really do now need to go beyond, you know, the viral suppression, um, and co-infections and STDs, and we need to be providing excellent primary care. So there are you know, some HIV-specific concerns, for example, treating and monitoring hepatitis B and C infection. You know, HIV doctors are really familiar with things like um, HIV and antiretroviral-associated metabolic conditions like testosterone deficiency and osteopenia, but we also need to be optimally managing things like diabetes. Cancer screening, you know, we're pretty good at anal cancer and cervical cancer, and I think we're also fairly great at, at uh, screening for hepatocellular carcinoma, but we also need to be encouraging our patients to pursue their general cancer screening, prostate, lung, breast, colon. Uh, of course, vaccinations, infectious disease doctors, we should definitely be encouraging our folks to be vaccinated, particularly covid um, you know, there is some data that uh, seems to suggest that or people living with HIV that had a very low CD4 nadir uh, were more likely to get ill with COVID. Um, that was most recently presented at a conference. And of course, you know, mental health and substance use, those things are ongoing issues. They impact the quality of life and the comorbidities of, of the people we care for. We need to be better coordinators also of multi-specialty care. But as our population ages, again, because you know, the face of HIV is changing, we should consider switching to different models of care, for example, geriatric models of care. And you know, here in the US, I, I, I really embrace the five Ms. So that really stands for mind or mentation, how are our patients thinking, mobility, their ability to function independently and, and uh, complete their independent activities of daily living, uh, multi-morbidity like we have been talking about medications. We need to be deprescribing as much as we possibly can and focusing on what matters most to, to a lot of our patients. It's, it's difficult when we try to complete the traditional screening because sometimes it, it could be pages of things that we need to be doing for our older adults with HIV. And, and they struggle with getting to appointments, but talking to them about, okay, this is the screening that is important to me. I think you need this what is important to you and how can we help you to achieve these, these screens um, is a huge value. Uh, additionally, you know, um, I do strongly believe that we should also be targeting modifiable factors. So let's think about the things that impact a lot of different comorbidities, a lot of different aspects of life, and let's try to, uh, things that are changeable or modifiable, and let's really focus and address those early on and ongoing through their lives. So one thing that impacts a lot of different comorbidities is weight gain. And weight gain has a, a lot of different reasons for, for why people, you know, especially people with HIV, are gaining weight. We know uh, substance use can be contributing. 
diet or even access to healthy foods, many of uh, the people that we care for don't have the money to go to the grocery store and buy you know, fresh vegetables and fruits and whole grains. Sometimes all they can afford are canned goods. And so they may not even have access to, to healthier types of foods. A lack of exercise, which could be due to a variety of factors, including whether or not they feel like they are, are living in a safe environment. I have patients that have said, I don't feel comfortable even walking around outside because my neighborhood is unsafe. Um, and then of course, things like depression uh, and whatnot. So these are multifactorial things um, that can contribute to weight gain. Um, you see, Miley, actually, I, I, I believe that in recent uh, years, uh, there has been uh, somehow a big, uh, a big uh, worry, especially in people living with HIV, regarding what was the contribution of uh, instant switching with weight gain. And uh, of course, uh, this is a hot topic. I, I said before how much is important the, the, the measurement of weight and especially ectopic fat with regard of the inflammatory process. Nevertheless, I would like to show you this data that we presented at CROI, in which uh, we tried to understand what was uh, the different contribution of traditional and uh, HIV-related factors with regard of weight gain. And we use a population in which uh, there was a 5% weight gain at the time of switching to INSTI. And uh, as a statistical approach, we used this uh, so-called population attributable factor that somehow helped to quantify the proportion of weight gain that could be eliminated if that particular risk factor was not present. And uh, let me say, Contrary to my expectation, the event switch to INSTI turned to be non-significant when I was able to describe in detail the physical activity of my patient. And we use a, a standardized questionnaire and uh, under the measure of meds. And so, understand me, I believe that uh, uh, INSTI and switch to INSTI play a role, but that the relative contribution disappeared compared to some factors like, for instance, initial BMI, CD4, CD8, high, and in particular, sedentary life, somehow suggesting the need that, first of all, we need to give, to empower the patient to make lots of education because a sedentary life is really what we need to fight in order to avoid weight gain at any time of the natural history of HIV disease. I 100% agree with you, you know, and, and here in the US, we have several lifestyle programs. For example, a classic one is the Center for Disease Control Lifestyle Change Program, also known as the Diabetes Prevention Plan or BPP. You know, this program incorporates a lifestyle coach that provides education um, and really encourages people to pursue exercise, join gyms and things of that sort, eat healthier. And it also couples it with a support group. So you also get that social support as you're making these positive changes in your life. But you know, the really interesting thing about the DPP, we've got about a decade of research uh, using this intervention um, that demonstrates that people lose weight. You know, there's a decreased incidence of sleep apnea, probably because of the weight loss, um, decreased incident of, uh, incidence of diabetes, and one study had even outperformed metformin um, to prevent the development of diabetes and prediabetics. Uh, reduced risk of cardiovascular disease and metabolic syndrome, improved general health and physical function, decreased pain and improved quality of life. And yet only about 1% of all eligible persons in the U.S. have ever accessed this program. So it's there, it's paid for by insurance, but very few people are actually accessing it. Similarly, the Ornish Lifestyle Medicine Program, also known as the Intensive Cardiovascular Rehab, it's a very similar program, except really focused more on cardiovascular outcomes rather than diabetes and weight loss. Um, this program incorporates a vegan, low-fat, whole grains diet, regular exercise, social connection, and uh, meditation and relaxation. And very similar findings to the DPP, including um, decreased atherosclerotic plaque. So this alone, you know, compared to people who are on medications, further decreased atherosclerotic plaque. So these interventions work. Um, the other thing I think that can be very valuable, so, you know, we as doctors, we're, we're used to diagnosing and prescribing things. It's kind of what we got trained to do, but we can prescribe lifestyle intervention. So uh, there was a great paper by Montoya and Christine Erlinson that 
basically, they developed an exercise prescription that we can be using for our patients. And I, I started to do this um, and, and I follow up on it. I also do a lot of social prescriptions in, in persons that I've identified as particularly lonely. And I also follow up on them um, when they come and visit me. So this is another thing that we as doctors can do uh, and should be doing for a lot of our older adults that are living with HIV. So only a small portion of eligible persons are participating in these lifestyle programs. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. So, you know, I think healthcare disparities, at least in the US, is a clear reason why only a small proportion of people are actually doing these things. You know, there's some adaptions that we can also make to enhance the feasibility and the maintenance of some of these programs. Um, and I want to just briefly mention one of those adaptions here. Um, so uh, we recently performed a study that used uh, recorded mindfulness lessons um, to evaluate its impact on people living with HIV who are experiencing depression, anxiety, and loneliness. And this is a randomized controlled trial. Um, and we found that people who were randomized to just listening to these pre-recorded programs, it wasn't even interactive. We just gave them the program and said, please listen, um, a program a, a day would be fantastic. In that period of time, people who did this had significant decreases compared to people who did not participate in their depression scores, their anxiety scores, and loneliness. So this is something you know, that could probably be very feasibly implemented to help, implemented to help uh, a lot of our older folks that are struggling with things like depression and anxiety and loneliness. Giovanni, what's your approach? You see, I, I think that we agree on most of what's said so far because uh, we, we wanted to be practical and we understand that, that we needed to prevent, but also to treat inflammation, treating and preventing comorbidities, but also treating and preventing frailty. Imagine nowadays we speak of uh, same day therapy, but also definitely the fact that we've got better dr drugs. And so here I depicted this issue in which uh, of course, what we want for all people living with HIV is to achieve the third 90 of the UN goal that is achieving undetectability. But this has been done in the past with drugs that maybe were geo-inducer because the toxicity associated with these drugs was somehow accumulating deficit, producing comorbidities. Nowadays, we are in the process to consider the contemporary uh, antiretroviral therapy, xenomorphic drugs, uh, drugs that may change the senescence on the, and even revert the senescence of uh, aging cell. And so uh, let me conclude with this image. We know that the mainstream for treating HIV is uh, the, the model of the 90-90-90-90 goal. That is uh, the fourth 90. The fourth 90 is achieving good health-related quality of life. Let me say achieving healthy living and healthy aging with HIV. And so if all what we said makes sense, I believe that uh, the metabolic health is a component of these uh, fourth 90. And so, let us conclude and uh, try to give uh, some remark. First of all, what we said is that uh, HIV leads to a dysregulation of the immune system, which trigger inflammation, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, and you know, antiretroviral therapy certainly decreases the HIV viral load. Doesn't one hundred percent completely eliminate uh, replication? So there's there's always a little bit of low level viral replication. We know. You know, as long as it's, it's low and people are taking their meds, it probably doesn't have a consequence in terms of development of resistance, but it can lead to a chronic inflammatory state. Um, and I think that highlights the importance of achieving and maintaining 100% adherence if possible. And uh, we also try to explain the association between inflammation and uh, metabolic dearrangement. And we know that uh, increasing uh, the risk of chronic diseases is really associated with this uh, immune metabolic process going on in people living with HIV. And that is what we want to treat. And as a clinician, you know, a lot of these comorbidities really can be addressed with good primary care, early cancer screening, lifestyle interventions, vaccinations, and early diagnosis and treatment of comorbidities. 
And so thank you all of you listening to this uh, webinar and uh, thank you for participating in this activity. Please continue to answer the question that follow and complete the evaluation. Thank you so much. This program was presented by Medscape Education Global.